Hey guys, in today's study with me video, I'm going to be showing you some of the studying methods that I've been using for my three university classes this quarter. Not gonna lie, it's been a really tough adjustment figuring out how to navigate, you know, my first actual quarter here at UCLA and online learning due to COVID, but hopefully by sharing my study methods and some of my tips and tricks, it will inspire you as well. As a quick side note, this weekend I'm going to be co-streaming a live panel discussion about what it means to grow up as an Asian American. It's going to be a super interesting conversation between a lot of prominent Asian American voices, and it's hosted by McDonald's in collaboration with act to change and in partnership with Next Shark. On Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, you'll be able to find it live on my channel page, and it'll stay posted there for a while after as well if you, you know, just can't make it live at the right time. If you're interested, be sure to check out the RSVP details in the description below. In the spirit of the stream, here's a little bit about what it was like for me growing up as an Asian American. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area here in California, which is an area that's got a lot of Asian people. It was a pretty great place to grow up as an Asian American since there were a lot of other Chinese and Asian Americans who could connect with my culture and the amount of racial diversity in the area meant that I very rarely got any sort of harassment about my race, whether that be bullying on the playground or microaggressions out in the street. Very rare occurrences, luckily for me. However, that downside of being around so many people who kind of look and grew up just like you was that I very unhelpfully developed this sort of not like other Asians complex, kind of like the whole not like other girls phenomenon, and just like how not like other girls or being a pick me is rooted in internalized misogyny, my whole shtick was very much rooted in internalized anti-Asian sentiment, very weird mixture of self-hatred, but in middle and early high school I felt this need to like differentiate myself. I was like, I'm not like all the other Asians in my very predominantly Asian school. I don't want to be a doctor or an engineer. I like the arts and humanities. I'm different. And and looking back, that was dumb as heck. It's cool to be like other Asians. Other Asians are very much smart, interesting, successful, fun individuals. But I think largely due to a lack of representation in Western media, or at most very poor representations, I had kind of seen Asian-ness flattened into this stereotype of just being nerdy and dorky and not really that fun to be around. So yeah, no one is immune to internalizing all of these racial beliefs that are perpetuated in parts of American culture. And I encourage you to look inwards and think about what problematic ideals you might have internalized yourself. If you're interested in hearing more discussion on what it means to be Asian American, I encourage you to attend the panel on Saturday. Once again, more details for how to RSVP will be in the description below. Now let's get on to the study with me content. First of the three classes I'm going to be discussing today is math, specifically multivariable calculus. And please don't ask me why I'm taking this class despite not having a STEM major. Perhaps I just like to suffer. Um, no, but actually I do enjoy math. And the first part of my study process for this math class is taking notes from the lectures. We have about three hours of lectures per week. They're divided up into three separate lectures that are about one hour each. So I've done my best to condense a little time lapse of my in-class note taking process, but it's not gonna be the whole thing because you do not wanna see 50 minutes of this, trust me. During each lecture, I write down all of the diagrams and theorems and definitions and practice problem examples that the professor goes over. If any of these steps don't really seem to make sense to me, I will be sure to note that down, whether that be to ask someone for help or just Google it, think about it a little bit more, just in case I don't get it. But luckily during this lecture, it seemed that I understood everything. Go me. On another note, I find iPad note taking super helpful for math since I can use the shape and straight line tools for all of my graph and other types of mathematical diagram drawing things. And it makes it easier to scooch things around the page, which I can't do on an actual notebook. Like, oh, maybe this definition fits better next to this graph and I can just scoot it over there once I've figured that out.
after I have gotten all this info into my brain and kind of sort of theoretically understand it thanks to the lecture, the next thing I need to do is, you know, actually make sure I understand it on my own by doing the assigned practice problems. We have one assignment a week, but it's a pretty freaking long assignment. Like, again, I'm not going to show the whole thing during this time lapse video because it is way too much footage. Like, I think my computer might explode if I tried to condense that into a time lapse shorter than three hours. But I digress. I work through all of the problems by myself when I can while referring to my lecture notes occasionally, but I try to keep that to a minimum so I can try to memorize the formulas. If there's anything I don't understand at all, I'll just note that down. Next, I will take it over to Slater.com. I very much do not recommend using this site to cheat on your homework. Academic dishonesty is not supported on this channel. What I do instead is I look at the very detailed answer explanations that some people have the goodwill to upload for free. I don't understand why people do it, but I'm so grateful to them. And I will use that explanation, see if I understand it, and if I don't, I will ask a tutor or my TA or my professor for help, but it seems like I understood things this time. Once again, go me. I will also just use Slater to check my answers for the problems I did understand and get a solution to because the homework is graded for accuracy for this class, and I just want to make sure I'm doing everything correctly. If something's wrong, as this problem appears to have been, I will go back through my work, find my mistakes, and arrive at the correct solution. It appears that this particular section was an exceptional case where I actually seem to understand the content quite well, but if I find one section to be quite difficult and I don't feel adequately prepared after finishing the homework, I will just find more practice problems online or through, you know, like paulsmathnotes.com or something and work on those until it feels like I have smoothed out all the gaps in my understanding. My next class is Introduction to Earth Sciences, which is basically like Geology 101. So kind of like with my math class, the first thing I do is take notes in lectures. And just like my math class, we have three lectures a week, which are approximately one hour each. I am using a slightly different note taking method though, but another one that allows me to take full advantage of the features that an iPad offers. Basically, as you can see me doing on screen right now, what I do is annotate the lecture slides, which the professor uploads before each lecture. Very convenient. Thumbs up. Thank you so much. My professor uses a lot of visual aids like graphs and diagrams and maps in his lecture, which are super helpful for explaining things clearly, aiding in our understanding of the material, but, you know, isn't really practical if I wanted to write all of this information down in a notebook just using a pen. Like, how am I going to copy down a photograph of rock layers or an entire diagram of local faults? The iPad just makes it so much more convenient to focus on writing the main points. Now, I find this class quite intuitive to understand. Maybe it's just because the professor explains things in such a clear manner. So the only real studying I have to do is not necessarily ironing out misunderstandings, but making sure I have it all committed to memory. And once again, in a very helpful manner, the professor makes it easy for us to do this too, because he includes the objectives for each like lesson slash chapter at the beginning of the slides. The main study method I use leading up to each midterm exam is I just copy down these objectives in a blank notepad in GoodNotes. Then I'll start by trying to you know, address the topic or answer the question entirely on my own. After that, using this like side-by-side -side tab split screen thing on GoodNotes, I will go through the lecture slides and my notes and add anything that I might have missed or make corrections to anything that I just got straight up wrong. I try to do this a couple times before each midterm, especially because although this class is quite chill, quite intuitive, the midterms all have a non-open book policy and since I am a goody two-shoes rule follower who likes to do things on the honor code, I actually don't check my notes. Um, so far it's actually worked out quite well. 
not to flex too hard, but I totally aced this first midterm that you can see me studying for without even using my notes. So kiddos, don't let anyone ever tell you that academic integrity is over. Last but not least is one of the classes I'm taking at the world famous UCLA Film School. This one is, you know, open to all UCLA students. It's about the history of the American motion picture, which is basically a history of moving images on film throughout American history, from short films to feature length movies, you know, like the two hour things we think of as movies today. Anyways, my study process for this class is mostly just about consuming the material and trying to understand it rather than focusing on, say, memorization. The first thing I do, just like all my other classes, is attend my lectures and take notes. This one is fully asynchronous, so we have two lectures a week, but we can kind of just watch them whenever we like, as long as we stay on track to complete all of our quizzes. The lectures vary in length. They're usually around 30 minutes with a 10 minute introduction slash historical context to the feature film for that day. While I'm taking notes, usually I just try to capture the details of anything that's presented on the slides and key points about the topics on the slides that the professor verbally mentions. The main information I'm sort of looking out for is just any detail I think might be on the quiz for that week or that I might find useful for some of our writing assignments, which are mostly about analyzing the films that we watch in class. Speaking of those feature films, we have two a week. I'll usually watch that right after lecture, you know, since I've just learned the historical context and information about the particular movie that I might need. After that, I will usually move on to the reading, since it's usually about the movie in some capacity, so it makes it more comprehensible when I do the reading after I watch the movie. The information that I'm looking for when I'm annotating my readings is quite similar to what I'm looking for when I'm watching my lectures. Usually I'm just highlighting some key quotes or key details and using the margins to summarize a couple of the main points that might be on a quiz or that might be super useful in an analytical essay. That's pretty much all the explanation I have left, so I'll just leave you with some relaxing music and this hopefully relaxing footage of me annotating things. I hope you found this video interesting and thank you for watching. I upload new videos about student life every week and I post photos of my notes and my life in general on my Instagram which is at studyquill. See you next time!